I look taller than you. I know. That's, that's you have to st I know. And sit on your coat. It brings you. Yeah. You okay. should always. Hi, everyone. I'm Tom Kennedy, Executive Director of ASMP. Welcome to another conversation in our ASMP Experts and Masters series of podcasts. I'm delighted today to have as our guest Lynn Goldsmith. But before we talk, start talking together, I wanted to do a quick shout out to Adorama, who's providing the exhibit, uh, space for us to do our podcast, and also to the podcast team brought, headed by Robert Kaplan Photo Brigade, who are doing great work for us in sponsoring this work. So thank you both. And uh, Lynn, great to have you on. It's great to be here. And I don't know if the audience can hear it, but Adorama just turned on the air conditioning. So we're going to be really cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, we started out pretty cool. As I recall, back in the 60s, uh, you and I grew up not too far from each other, and you got started in photography. Uh, tell me about your first experiences and what drew you to photography. I think what drew me was uh, what would draw any little girl is that her father was a serious amateur photographer. And in order to hang out with her dad, it was best that she pick up a camera because it meant that he would take her in the dark room and show her the magic that could happen in there and develop a kind of bond that I believe fathers and daughters yearn to have. So I was very lucky in that way. And then I would use my camera to tell stories with my dolls because I would spend a lot of time with my dolls. And it was far more interesting to dress them, make clothes for them with my grandmother, and uh, create characters and just images that to me were um, really meaningful. When did you start moving out of the bedroom and, and starting <laughs> to do photography for yourself? What were your first, you know, what were your first targets of opportunity? How did you think about yourself as a photographer? Well, I always made pictures. One reason was because um, I have astigmatism in my right eye. And I, I think uh, Arthur Elgord, I'm pretty sure, and a number of other photographers are pretty much one-eyed individuals. So I don't see very well out of that eye. And the still image allowed me to focus with my left eye and to uh, create and to think uh, what was within a frame. Um, so in that way, um, that was really an important part of my wanting to keep on taking pictures. It started probably when I was about uh, seven years old and I always took pictures, but I didn't think I would be a photographer. I never considered that. I, uh, I thought I'd be a singer-songwriter. There were a number of ideas, as all uh, children have, about the possibilities, including ballerina. Um, but I felt that uh, the still image really kind of centered me. It's a feeling that I've had since I was very young. However, when I went to college and uh, from then on, I was making little films. I made the first films at Electra Records of The Doors, Judy Collins, uh, Delaney and Bonnie, and I would place them in various um, uh, uh, venues for promotion. So I met a person named Joshua White who had the Joshua Light Show at the Fillmore, and we created Joshua Television, and I became a director for Joshua Television. So everything in life, I think, is circuitous. Lots of people ask me, like, how did you get to be where you are? It's not, it's not an easy question to answer. If you're interested in terms of rock and roll, I have a book called Rock and Roll Stories. You can read it there. But my journey, because from Electra Records, where I made these films, I then became a director for Joshua TV. And from there, I moved to ABC TV. And I was the first director of a television show called In Concert. 
Um, and during that period, I realized I really didn't want to make films. I realized my films were actually stills. And I met uh, Grand Funk Railroad because I was doing a special for ABC called Phoenix House. And I did the documentary section where we went around to these halfway houses which help uh, drug addicts, particularly young drug addicts. So I came up with an idea for Grand Funk for their next record and for who would produce them. And I said that I would work for nothing if, uh, if when they got a hit single, I would be 50% of management. <laughs> I think you always have to be ready uh, to understand that risk equals reward. And if you fail in that process, it's not a failure because the lessons learned take you to the next place. And so all my previous history had um, had just supported that. So when I uh, started with Grand Funk, I had a plan to make a film on them. We're an American band and put them together with Todd Rundgren because I had been a singer songwriter. As I said, this is all in my book. It can go on and on and on. Right. Uh, and, and anyway, it's all explained in there. But um, if, uh, if we want to get on with Grand sure. Funk, because I did the first album, uh, We're an American Band, but this second album, which we see now on screen, Shining On, mm -hmm. um, I'm, that was the first 3D album with punch out glasses. And I was very excited about doing that. And because I didn't have a 3D camera, I had to figure out like how to make my still images look like they were 3D. And because I have to know so much about the difference between my right eye and my left eye, especially for like parallel parking, <laughs> um, I kind of figured out what one has to do to make it look like it's 3D. Uh, and what I love about this is that Ansel Adams called me up because he was working on a, 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 a 3D project with uh, Kodak. And he wanted to know how I did this. And I said, well, if you'll come and let me work with you in the dark room for two weeks, I'll be happy to tell you. <laughs> that sounds like a great trade. Well, I always think risk equals reward. Right, right. right. <laughs> uh, so that's what I did. And I lived with he and Alma. And that also taught me a lot of uh, lessons about how much music and photography is connected and how much mathematics really has to do with it all. So photography has allowed me to express myself as an artist, not just to um, uh, uh, manifest a print, which makes me feel good. Um, the expression of it is something. So I started, because I had control with Grand Funk, I obviously became 50% manager when it was, when American Band hit number one in all three trades, uh, and it was their first hit single, uh, that they let me do anything. So this was the back of the next album called Caught in the Act, and I took my pictures and I created silhouettes of each one of them. Um, I like to think I'm a precursor to Chuck Close's work. <laughs> Even though I'm not as old as him, I think I was doing it first. And, um, you know, oftentimes, particularly in the genre of uh, uh, music portraits, uh, people think that you just shoot concerts or you just shoot uh, rock and roll. Um, I shoot what interests me. Um, and one of the things that interested me was um, obviously Bob Dylan because he had had such a profound effect upon my thinking when I was like 15. I think that's a really important age. And oftentimes when I'm doing uh, photo shoots with people, it doesn't matter if they're famous or not famous, I will look up what was on the top of the charts when they were 15 years old and I will select music to play, whether it's on location or in the studio, bringing it along with me, the music that I think they would respond well to. So anyway, it was late at night and I got a call from uh, Moogie Klingman who owns Secret Sound 
and he said, uh, do you want to come by and, um, and photograph Bob Dylan? He's here recording. And I said, yeah, but does he know? I don't really like to photograph people if it's um, in your face surprise. Right. I don't mind doing work like I did for you, uh, also because you were uh, the best designer and the best editor, National Geographic. If you guys don't know, you sure should. Um, uh, but, you know, to be able to, um, uh, to photograph something by being a fly on the wall, you have to develop a skill set in the same way that you have to develop one when you have to be outgoing right. for personalities that you need to bring out. And with Bob Dylan, I knew I'd be walking into a situation where he's recording. It's like, does he want to be photographed? I'm, I always put myself in someone else's shoes for all things. And I think, if I'm recording, do I want this stranger walking in here and snapping pictures of me? Um, but I wanted Bob Dylan, so I was ready to give it a try. And uh, as I was uh, in the cab going down to the studio, because I was really nervous, no one other than Fred Astaire, no celebrity ever meant anything to me except Bob and Fred. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it was like, I said, I'm going to shoot Bob Dylan, I'm going to shoot Bob Dylan. I thought, it, I, I did sound like a crazy person, and the cab pulled over and said, get out of my cab. And I said, why? He said, I don't carry no assassins. So I said, no, 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 I'm a photographer. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I got out of the cab when I uh, arrived, and I knew when I got in the elevator that I had to make the decision, either I'm a fan or I'm a photographer. And if you're a photographer, there's no fan involved. You have to perceive what the fan might want to experience when they look at an image because they don't have that access. And it's your honor, your privilege to bring that to them. So talk about how, that's a, that's a fascinating comment. And talk about sort of how you arrive at that at the conclusion of what that is and and then make it manifest I think I've always felt that when people allow you to make an image of them it's it's a responsibility to provide something in the world um, that's positive or that is completely truthful. Um, there is a choice because the lenses that you pick, the angles that you choose to shoot at um, can definitely sway the perception of an image. And today, that with digital technology, it's even more of a power that the photographer holds to do that because you can also add other elements to a photograph to make it appear to be a single image that was created in a moment in time and that's not the case. Um, there's, there's so many different elements at work. But I knew with Bob that I had to ask him directly. Mm -hmm. I, I made that decision in the elevator. I'm a photographer, not a fan. And when I walked out, um, he was in the studio, and I just walked right up to him. I didn't wait for anything. I wasn't afraid. And I stuck my hand in his, and I said, Hi, I'm Lynn Goldsmith, and I'm, I'd like to make some pictures of you. And he said, oh, I'm really sorry, but uh, I have a photographer here. And uh, I said, well, I said, that's one point of view, but with two photographers, you get two points of view. And he kind of smiled and said, well, oh, I get your point of view. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, then I can shoot, right? See, it's always good to be positive. Right. I wasn't waiting for yeah, him yeah. to say, you can go ahead and shoot. Right. So he laughed and he said, oh, okay, yeah. Um, and I said, you know, well, just tell me if I do anything that isn't in your best interest, you know, you don't want me doing, and I'm happy to go. Uh, and that didn't happen, thankfully. Do you find, did you find that you 
you had to make those kinds of approaches to a lot of your musical subjects in order to get their cooperation, that the direct approach of explaining yourself and what you were about and wanting to, you know, shape the shoot in a certain way that that was valuable to to the to the relationship building. well when uh generally speaking first of all once you photograph people like bob dylan then automatically for no good reason celebrities trust you hmm. they think <laughs> he wouldn't have let her shoot him um but you don't know you know uh, there's more trepidation about that today than there was. Uh, this picture was made in like 1975, right. uh, so it's a it, it's a little bit different. But in if I was photographing them in the studio, I learned over a period of time that it would be really good in my green room to have photographs of all the people that I'd photographed who would be impressive to them because there are many photographs that I love which are not well-known people. Um, and I didn't have to say anything. And then I learned to make a little booklet if I went on location and somebody didn't know who I was and I would show them first some of my work. So by showing the work, right there you have earned a certain amount of trust. I also explain, depending on the person, that for me to really be able to make our time valuable together, because I tell them I, I relish that their time is valuable to them, okay? And I also say my time is valuable to me. So great photography is a collaboration when it comes to portraiture. That's my opinion anyway. And uh, without it, we're wasting a lot of time. Um, and I just think my uh, direct approach, in addition to um, sometimes uh, uh, my husband <laughs> says I'm brutally honest, you know, like suck in your stomach or, you know, I got to slap their faces to like get the jawline to relax. But they know why I'm doing it and that I'm doing it because I care that they look good. Do you find your satisfactions as a creative person differ depending on whether you're doing portraiture or say capturing a live performance or do the feelings that you have as a photographer remain pretty constant in that in, in a oh, sense? Oh no, my, my feelings as a photographer um, have a lot to do with who I'm photographing. I photographed a Nobel Prize winner who, uh, Leon Letterman, that I will uh, never forget um, and learned a number of lessons from him. Uh, and, and so for me, the camera has always been a learning tool. Um, it was also, and now this term is used all the time, but I always said this, it's a passport. Uh, and this passport has taken me to meet a lot of people. The reason I'm showing you this picture of myself right now. Sitting in <laughs> Central Park. Sitting in Central Park right. is because Steve Winwood is a very shy guy. Mm -hmm. And I thought my studio was on 61st Street. So I thought, let's take a walk in the park first. And I sat in this position and gave Steve the camera because I want the other person to know what it feels like to be me behind the camera. What are you shooting? How comfortable is it? What are you really seeing? And in some way, I'm also subtly not only figuring out, is this position comfortable to sit in, okay? Uh, but I know that they will probably model me model what I do right and that's exactly what happened and once they're comfortable and once they understand that there's a lack of comfort as well in being behind the camera you know like I would say Steve give me some direction you know and he was uncomfortable kind of like talking and shooting <laughs> and, and I said he said like what you know and I said like tell me to look up you know, so, it, you know, doing those role model changes 
or just modeling interactions has um, a big effect on the rest of the shoot. Um, with someone like Ozzy Osbourne who was coming in the studio, you, you, I had a very short period of time to shoot him. It was like an hour. And I always have props around because you wanted to get something wild and crazy, but it's early in the morning. Ozzy has been up all night. He's probably been drinking, okay, at that point in his mm-hmm. life. And he, he's not really going to be screaming and doing the things that, like, Ozzy Osbourne of Black Sabbath should do. So my mother had come back from Bali and given me these nails. And I gave him, like, a character to be. So you always have to be thinking about who someone is. Right. Um, And in this situation, I actually uh, was photographing for a uh, Bill Cosby TV show that Lisa Bonet was starring in, and it was for their ads or whatever. And her boyfriend, who was unknown at the time, Lenny Kravitz, uh, was there. And Lenny had never made a record nothing um he was just going with lisa and i lisa was uh kind of consumed with things that were going on with the cosby show but i so i started off by saying let me make a portrait of you and lenny (laughs) so that's another way of looking for what prop lenny served not Mm. unlike my mother's nails from bali right 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 Um, In this situation, I was uh, supposed to photograph uh, him for, uh, this is uh, Don of the Eagles. Don Henley. Don Henley. Sorry about that. That's all right. I'm getting old. That's okay. I was supposed to photograph Don Henley of the Eagles at Walden uh, Pond. Walden. No, Walden Woods. Okay. (laughs) And Walden Pond. I get it. You know, I was confused then. I'm still confused. But what happened was I took him to the pond, okay, and he looked pretty unhappy. So I said, is there a problem here? And he said, well, my fundraiser is really about the woods. And I went, oh, my, not the pond. So I said, oh, my God. So I went looking, and thank God I found this sign. You know, so props yeah. oftentimes uh, can save the day. I wanted to talk to you a little bit just before we move on about something that I was really struck by in the introduction to your rock and roll book. And that was you talked about music being sort of the life story of everyone and that the lyrics and the emotions that flow from music really have this sort of cathartic effect in releasing people's energy and 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 allowing them to realize the bonds of community in a way that perhaps if the music wasn't there they would not realize talk a little bit about that as a motivation for you in terms of working with artists and working with musicians in the way this that you have well i think it's always been uh clear to me because music was so helpful to me in my own uh youth um and it was how my generation in addition to clothing, could kind of decide if a new friend, a new possible friend you were meeting was in your tribe, Mm -hmm. uh, what music they knew, what they wore. Um, But I always felt there was a very strong connection between music and the brain. And later on, I hope we get to talk about Will Powers, which is my AKA. And that's exactly why I made this record. That's exactly why I switched my focus, um, because I do think that uh, music as a universal language is the key to um, uh, opening up each other to our humanity. Um, And um, yeah. So it seems like that your photographs in that genre conveyed a certain kind of significant or attempted to express a certain kind of significance about what it meant to you but also you know by extension what it meant to other people well that music the music didn't have to mean anything to me for example uh right now we have a picture of miles davis up on the screen okay and i miles davis was not in my vocabulary Mm -hmm. right um and i really didn't care 
Yet my assistants on this shoot or anyone else who knew I was going to photograph Miles Davis was like, Miles Davis? Now, first of all, even if I never did like Miles Davis, which I did, you know, I didn't really know his music. Um, and I do love Miles Davis now. I just want to get that in there. But um, uh, I, for me, the respect of what music can do for the person who loves it doesn't make me judgmental. Mm -hmm. It's not like I think uh, Justin Bieber isn't of value. You know, I, when I photograph someone, I'm photographing them with the heart of a fan. Um, I've never really been a fan, as I said, except of Dylan's and Fred Astaire. Uh, so I don't really know what it's like, but I do know the powerful effect that music has in uh, connecting people. And I think it's to be valued. So when I did this session, Miles had been um, really rude and mean to me all day long. I, I didn't get a picture off for like eight hours. He said, Lynn, I want you to go up into my closet. I want you to go in there and I want you to pick out what you want me to wear. This is just an example of what he would do. So I said, okay, Mr. Davis. I was calling him Mr. Davis for a reason, okay? He, he was demanding that I do that. It's like Miss Diana Ross or something. But um, so I went up in the closet and I, first of all, I was shocked at what I found in there. But um, I came down the stairs with some clothes, and he, as I came down with them, he said, what were you doing in my closet? I mean, that's the kind of thing that I went through for I don't know how many hours. Like, he would tell me he wanted to shoot down at the beach. And as you can see from this picture, the beach is, like, down below, maybe, like, I don't know, 500 steps. We took all the lighting down there, everything. And then he'd go, like, I don't want to shoot on the beach. You know? So by this point, I was pretty upset. And uh, it was the day was kind of coming to an end. Right. And I put on some Bulgarian folk music because I love that, and it calms me. And he said, get that music off of there, right? And I said, you really are an asshole, aren't you? So <laughs> I didn't care at that point, right? And he said, son, his son was there, get me my horn. And he proceeded to play right to my face right to my face and I went from hatred I really hated him and I hated myself for allowing my self-esteem to be lowered by him by letting myself go through that for it was like six hours I was really mad at both of us uh, uh, and I just wanted out of there and I have to say that when he played I swore, and the clouds opened up, I, I swore it was Gabriel. Wow. And I felt this was the greatest honor of my journey. Um, it, it was, it, it was, uh, it took my spirit and wiped away all anger. All, and I'm an angry person. <laughs> so it really, uh, it really, opened me up and uh, you know so now I listen to Miles music all the time and I feel that uh, we made an image that speaks of the moment what 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 do you feel working with musicians has taught you about life oh well working has taught me I do believe that work is a teacher mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't really matter what you do um, what the camera has done uh, for me is it's kind of um, shortened the time of how quick you learn a lesson. <laughs> you know, it's pressurized. Mm -hmm. um, the more you uh, put challenges on yourself, uh, the greater the likelihood is 
that you're going to learn a lesson. I don't think I would be interested in doing anything that I wasn't learning from. Mm -hmm. So it's taught me, uh, first and foremost, uh, that the uh, messenger is not the message. Uh, Just because, and Miles is a great example of that. He was a jerk to me. I don't care how high someone is, Mm -hmm. and I don't mean literally high. Right. (laughs) Um, But, you know, it, it really taught me that what you can get from a song doesn't mean the person who wrote that song even gets that lesson. It doesn't mean that the person has been there. Everybody's like, in my opinion, on their journey. So uh, it's what your intention is. And my intention, whether I'm listening to a song uh, or making an image, reading a book, walking down the street is what can I learn? That's a great, that's a great uh, comment because I think that photography is often perceived in a certain way for its own sake, but it's, it's really a vehicle for something else that's larger. And I think that's really, you know, that's, that's a fascinating comment. Well, it's selfish. Uh, it's <laughs> no, I mean, there's a like, you know, the bottom line is whether I make them look good or not or whatever it is, I'm passionate about it because I'm passionate about learning and I'm curious. That's a great quality. I think it's an essential quality to be a successful photographer is really having a having not only the skill with observation, but also sort of the curiosity to see where it can take you. That was what drew me in. You know, I was telling you earlier uh before we started talking about my own experiences getting started in photography. And I just saw it as this amazing vehicle to go places and see people and see things that I would never have the chance to be exposed to if I didn't, you know, have the camera in my hand. So I I think that's really interesting that you say that. What, what, I know you're known primarily for, or in a lot of circles as a, a photographer who's covered music and the music, music scene and musicians but I know that your portrait and other work extends far beyond that and I remember some of our collaborations when I was at National Geographic and I wanted to tell you a story that you did a article I think it was for Traveler on the Circus and then that turned into a book and you were kind enough to give me a copy of the book when it came out and my daughter was probably somewhere in the three to four range. And we had a next door neighbor who had a portrait, a black velvet portrait of a clown. And she was fascinated by the clown portrait and would ask every day to go over and see the clown at this, our neighbor's house. So I showed her your book and said, this is Lynn's circus book. So that became the first photo book that my daughter ever encountered. And, uh, and she would insist, because she was just still learning to read, that I would read her sections of you know, the captions and make up stories about what was in the picture. So I just wanted to share that with you. Well, I'm really honored, (laughs) and I did make it for kids, and I hoped that it would be interesting for adults, but it was meant for your daughter's age. And part of that is because, uh, you know, I do believe that the child, which I try to maintain in me all the time, um, is is the highest of us, and we kind of get uh, more fearful, uh, a number of things as we get older. So when you gave me that assignment of the uh, Great Circus Parade, I have to say, at first, I was really upset because everybody was getting assignments like, you know, I wanted to go to Thailand. I wanted to go to somewhere in China. And I oh, I got like Las Vegas. I get like Wisconsin. That's where the Great Circus right. Parade is. And I have to say, I rolled my eyes and I thought, well, maybe I'm working my way up to like those better I, better assignments you know you thought that was better but the lesson I learned at the Great Circus Parade is it was the first place that I'd ever been to where this huge event was put on that had so many volunteers that brought their Clydesdale horses 
from all over America with no payment, people who made costumes, people who all the people who, who uh, uh, came together, the retired people who animators and stuff who worked at Disney to fix the wagons to reshape America, and anyone who gave money to support this parade year after year, they weren't allowed to have any banners or show any sponsorship. Wow. And so people, that's what drew, you know, it was such a real American event because it didn't have to do with money. It had to do with celebration of the, in my mind, of the child within us and not losing a respect for the past history, which were those circus wagons and how the Clydesdales pulled them through the town. So I, this is just one small example of the honor that I've had to have a camera that takes me into these lives where I can learn that there are people on the planet, okay, who have a value system which is aligned with the kind of goodness that I think every child comes into this world with. Wow. So. <laughs> well, that really stopped you. No, it Should did. we go to the next Sh picture? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know how much time we have. Well, I, I wanted, should flow I wanted, through I, things. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the authors that you've also covered. You know. Oh, well, let me. Let me. Uh, yeah, you know. Okay. Because it's, it's interesting to me that while you're known for your, you know, for your. I didn't put up. Did I put authors in here? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sorry. Well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I put a few. Yeah. 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 You know, you had said earlier that shooting them in part because you were interested in what they had to say as authors and the books that they were writing and that sort of thing. Did you find working with them to be different than it was with musicians or were you looking for different things from uh, them in the <laughs> encounters? Uh, I photograph people. I don't photograph musicians and, you know, that's not what my mindset is. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, in this photograph of R.D. Lang, which I made in 1972, I went to a lecture that he was giving because I had read uh, 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 Jack and Jill. I had read um, uh, The Divided Self and his take on what schizophrenia is and other aspects of mental illness. Um, I so connected and learned a new way of perceiving. And so I felt R.D. Lang was a very deep thinker and I wanted to hear him speak, but I also hoped I might make a portrait. And he was on a stage where there were stage lights and after he spoke, I mean, he didn't know who I was or anything, and I went to the front, not that I was anybody, you know, I'm just saying I wasn't there mm -hmm. from Newsweek or Time or anything. Um, I just went to the front and I said, um, you know, Dr. Lang, could you just step forward because there were stage lights that came up? Because I, f I knew if he looked down into the stage lights, the kind of photograph I could make. My photographs are generally in my head before I manifest them. So that's what's so great for me about still photography compared to film. There's an immediacy that I can know if I got it or not and a gratification level opposed to the long term that it takes when filmmaking so when I made this image, um, I actually uh, had wanted to work for Vogue. And I uh, went up there and I submitted it. And the next thing I knew, Alexander Lieberman gave me a call. And he, uh, I don't know why he didn't hire me after that, but he wanted to tell me, even though they weren't running it, what a beautiful portrait it was. And um, I was, really inspired and honored by that and it gave me this is the other thing when you have a when you're young and you have a positive experience that you ask someone to do something because it's not like I'm comfortable doing that 
I'm scared. I'm uncomfortable. I have to keep busting through fear, but I can look back to a set of experiences that I did it and I was rewarded for it. So the fact that someone I respected thought that that was a really good portrait um, really uh, allowed me, I think, because you have it in the back of your mind. If you have an image, don't let that moment go. At least ask, because if you don't ask, you won't receive. Right. And do you, I mean, I know that you had this shot of Tony Robbins and going through the sky, skydiving, and I, you know, that's an, uh, that's literally busting through, I would imagine, a fear of jumping out of an airplane, right? Well, jumping out of an airplane, I, I should have a picture here of me with my camera and my helmet. Yeah. Uh, because although I was attached to another diver, you know, I had to be shooting right. while I was right, doing right. that. Yeah. I, I, uh, I think, yeah, yeah. there's... Yeah. <laughs> There's Tony skydiving. But I did a whole story for Life magazine in 1984. And one of the reasons uh, that I got that story, as you know uh, from Geographic, photographers uh, uh, tell you what it is they'd like to do and why. And then it's your decision if it's worthy or not. And because of my interest in how people bust through fear. Tony at the time was doing fire walking. Um, I wanted to spend time with Tony Robbins. So I called up Life and explained the story. He wasn't as famous as he is now. Um, and they gave me the story to do. In, um, uh, it's, it's not unlike this with R.D. Lang, who was dying of AIDS. And uh, one of the reasons that in college I dropped that's Leary. I, I mean Timothy yeah, yeah, Leary. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, I have yeah, our delay. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry yeah, about that. Yeah. It's a, it's age. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, but one of the reasons uh, uh, that I was able to make this portrait and wanted to is because uh, his his writings and his life had such a powerful effect on me that before he passed, I wanted to see him, and then it had a double whammy in that he had AIDS. So if you could bring attention to the AIDS epidemic with a passing, a horrible passing of someone so uh, valuable to mankind, um, that's a privilege. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going backwards. Now, that's, <laughs> that's uh, Ram Dass or, or right, uh, Richard yes. Alpert. Right, yeah. I know him. Yeah. yeah. And uh, after I met him, it was actually because, and of course I'd read his book, but it was, bef it was also because um, I knew that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who had written a book called On Death and Dying, uh, was going to be there for this fire ceremony. So once again, the, you know, it's, it's me wanting to learn. These, these photographs just underscore that. And I can share that with other people. So talk a little bit about the Willpower Project in that vein also, because I think that that, to me, was pretty fascinating. Okay. Well, Willpowers, <laughs> it was uh, 1982, and um, I had in the past, I had done singing and songwriting. I mean, from the time I was 12, uh, I was singing in coffee houses. I had a band in college called The Walking Wounded. But I made the decision, which is in the book. You'll have to read it. I won't go into it now. Uh, we're probably short of time. <laughs> but um, uh, I was in the Bahamas, and I was photographing Robert Palmer. And he had this uh, loop playing in his house while I was photographing. Uh, and uh, he couldn't come up with a melody for it. So I've always had this idea about putting a voice, a speaking voice, this was, I hadn't ever, there was no rap then, uh, about putting a speaking voice that delivered a message of mental health <laughs> um, to danceable music, because I also think movement and dance are part of mental health. It's all, you know, the evolution that we experience as individuals is uh, uh, spiritual, mental, and physical. So uh, I do believe that 
um, that physical thing of movement and dance can open you up to uh, uh, to hearing things, to seeing things that you might not have been open to. And when I made the Will Powers record, it was really good for me because I immediately had a hit song called Kissing with Confidence in England. Um, and I had to do a lot of press for it. And I was put in a room for like three days where they brought in press from all over Europe and who would ask me the same questions over and over again. And I said to myself, you know what? I don't want to be on tour buses. I don't, I, I, you know, I like performing. Uh, but I don't want to do all the other things that I know are part of making this my life. Um, I'm, I, I just want my life to be my life, and hopefully people will get it. I also, people don't know if I'm, many people uh, just thought I was, uh, uh, take, I don't know if you can say it, taking the piss out of uh, self-help. Um, and I'm not. Uh, I am using humor mm -hmm. because I think the ability to laugh at yourself, to laugh at what others may or may not do to you, is key <laughs> to a healthy life. So yes, I do try to be funny on the record, and I do think that chanting, but it doesn't matter what your chant is, it's the intention behind it. So that's more of what the will powers is all about that's that's interesting i mean it's so fascinating that you you know that you're able to bring all this together in a certain way i think well it's what's really even more fascinating is that was 1983 but currently for the olympics for the x games uh this song adventures and success is used um by squarespace for a commercial, which I only allowed because I have been asked for other things, uh, Keanu Reeves stands on top of his motorcycle, and he, there's no selling a product. He just repeats after me. They play my song while he's standing up, and it's him, it's not a stunt double, riding the motorcycle, repeating after me. And um, at the end of it, he sits down and rides off, and they just say Squarespace. So, um, so I allowed that for Will Powers. In fact, you know, obviously, I'm really happy about it. <laughs> and um, yeah, and it's helped to fund my GoFundMe. Well, that brings <laughs> me to the final part of what I wanted to talk to oh. you about, which is, you know, I know you as a fierce um, advocate and defender of artists photographers rights and you know we've talked a lot about some of the issues that you've been facing with respect to defending the copyright of your own work and I know you're embroiled in some things now and I thought it would be really important to kind of end our conversation talking about this issue and and you know your views about the importance of copyright and how ASMP is one of the organizations that's always been fiercely in support of um, photographers' rights that, you know, we could talk about that. Yes, I've been an ASMP member since 1976, and I have to say that be, from being a member, I learned so much about pricing my photos, about copyright. There are the basics of business to take responsibility for your images. And ASMP was incredibly helpful with the information, which in those days, it's not even as easy to get as it is. They were also helpful with my insurance because they had a great <laughs> policy uh, for us. But anyway, because of that, I was always very careful with my licenses that I gave to magazines for my work. Uh, I was careful about um, uh, where I placed my pictures, how I placed my pictures, uh, how I was credited for my pictures. And ASMP, when it comes to uh, this case, which if people don't know, um, I have a photograph of Prince that I made in 1981 uh, for Newsweek. Um, you didn't uh, put it yeah, in. Yeah, oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you can see here the uh, photograph which I made in my studio. And uh, 
that was on an assignment for Newsweek. I had suggested it to Newsweek and they gave it to me. Um, and recently, after Prince died, I kept seeing this image and the eyes, I never forget eyes. Mm -hmm. It looked familiar to me. And I looked at it and it's my photograph of Prince. Uh, so I contacted them and I said, that's my picture. <laughs> and they were like, well, what do you want? And I was like, well, I don't know. You have to tell me how you used it. I, you know, I didn't know about it before. Um, and I also had discovered right about that time that it was on the cover of the commemorative issue of uh, Vanity Fair. So um, uh, before, uh, before I knew it, instead of that dialogue going further, um, they sued me. They sued me for my own copywritten image, and they called it a preemptive lawsuit. Now, in this world, uh, when you sue somebody, the person being sued has to answer with a lawyer, and uh, all of that costs money. Uh, so, of course, when they did this, I was going to not only get a lawyer to answer it, but to counter sue. I believe that the, the, the thing today, besides the fact that so many people think that photography is just there for the taking because of social media, because of how the fair use aspect of the copyright law has been used, in my opinion, in many ways that do not qualify as fair use because there's areas that define fair use, like what is transformative. Right. Right. Well, I'm only telling your, the people. Um, but anyway, I felt that especially the fact that they not only made fine art prints and sold it and blah, 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 but they had also licensed the image. That affects me and all photographers or visual artists, not just photographers, because you can take a picture, make it high contrast, uh, put it, yeah, I have a little video on my GoFundMe, Warhol vs. Goldsmith, um, and in 30 seconds, you know, besides the fact that you can make a quote unquote Warhol, uh, you can do other things to it, and then you could license it. Not just make fine art prints. There are people who just think that they can take it, put it on mouse pad covers, whatever it is. And, you know, I, by 1981, I mean, I'd made a big investment in time and money of being a photographer. I carried a studio, employees. If, and magazines don't pay much. The idea was that you live on your royalties. You live on your license fees. You live on your future. In addition to the fact that you may want in the future to do something with your own photographs. In addition to the fact that now with digital technology, there are tools for you to do things with your images. As I uh, showed you uh, one of, uh, it might be back here somewhere, of uh, Patty Smith. Maybe you can pull it up later since I don't know where it is. Um, hopefully you can stick that in there and I could explain that. Um, that you can make your, you know, and that maybe you want to switch from being a commercial photographer to more of a fine art or, or your career goes in that direction. But the other aspect is you have created, especially in celebrity portraiture, a reputation over a number of years, okay, which is based on trust. Right. And that can be wiped out. Yes, The absolutely. artist isn't going to come back to you and say, they just say, don't use her again. Don't use him again. Right. So there's so many areas that it affects the photographer's livelihood. Now, ASMP, with only 4,000 members, when there are unions that have more membership, and that really frustrates me, okay, with their small membership, have not only made a donation, but on their website, you know, they made a statement, which I think clearly defines 
what's at stake here for us all. And the idea is not that I'm going to make money by suing Warhol. They, they accused me in their lawsuit of extortion when I hadn't brought up any money. Um, and, and a number of other things that are ridiculous, that this was a publicity picture handed out as a press photo. It never was. Um, uh, but that, um, uh, wait, there was a reason in my, uh, ca oh yeah, so this lawsuit, forget b it being about that, I want the public, particularly visual artists, to understand and take responsibility for copyright, not just the, the joy of making the art, mm -hmm. but the responsibility, like the joy of having children, there's a responsibility to having those children. And I feel very, very strongly that if we don't stand up now, our rights are gone. So I intend on going all the way to the Supreme Court. W because if I win, they'll appeal it. If they win, I'll appeal it. And already, um, you know, the uh, GoFundMe has a certain amount in it. I've spent 10 times that amount. And any monies awarded to me, which will be used to pay my legal fees, will also be used to give to organizations, ASMP being number one of those, okay, to help protect copyright uh, and what that means for us. If we don't stand up now, it seems like a small issue in light of many of the issues that are going on today, life and death issues, mm -hmm. you know. So part of me feels guilty asking for a penny for that, but I need to fight the fight. Because in the long run, this is, it's not even the long run. With digital technology the way it is and with what's going on, it's now. Well, that's what I, I, that's what I feel very strongly is the conversation that needs to be had in part. Not only uh, artists standing up for themselves and protecting themselves appropriately with copyright, but also persuading the public that the work that we do has a value and that the people who do it are doing it for a variety of reasons but they have to make a living being able to do it and that their ability to make a livelihood is no less valuable than other ways of making a living in this world and I think uh, we just really need to change the tenor of the conversation well, so I appreciate having a conversation. I just want to bring up, today. even in a small way, because it is fair use. I have someone who I think they're on Twitter or whatever, and they post my pictures every day. I don't even know who they are. I've asked them to stop. They don't. They keep doing it. They have a certain number of followers, and because they have that many followers, they're getting paid. Okay. I don't even have that many followers, so, mm -hmm. so it's like there's so many levels, even if it's the small stuff, where there's online magazines. There's one that I just contacted the other day. They use like 20 of my Patti Smith pictures. They have advertising on there. I mean, this has got to stop because it costs us to have cameras, to have a livelihood. And, and, and it's not, you know, they use that thing that because Anyone and everyone is a photographer. Right. And the equipment is such today that it is possible to make good images, okay, if you have a good eye and you know a little bit about Photoshop, right, or, or any of the Lightroom uh, uh, techniques, um, to, uh, to, to put work out there. So fine, make your own, you know, but respect other people's work and it, it's it's just um out of hand and i know so many photographers who have said to me oh lynn i know mine too blah 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 so i say share th you know what if everyone gave five dollars to this right it not only would would Warhol Foundation lawyers see the like bankroll that's there for it, right? The world and they would see how many people are behind me in this fight to protect our copyrights. I think that's great. Um, you know, well, obviously we're going to be continuing this conversation and we're going to be following the developments in your case and I look forward to future 
conversations with you about all of this. It's been great to have a conversation with you. Uh, I love your passion. I love your enthusiasm. I have for a long time. And ditto, I ditto, ditto. I ditto. really appreciate having you on today. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And please uh, look for us on your favorite po podcast platforms and leave us a rating and a review. It helps spread the word about what we're doing here with ASMP Experts and Masters. Again, thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Thanks. That went real quick.